Okay, there we go. So, Casey, maybe you can let me know if everybody can see that. Yeah, I can see it. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, I am Alan Shepherd. I work as a community led housing enabler or officer, um, to use my correct job title. Um, I work for the Wales Cooperative Centre, as does uh, Casey, Claire, Joe, and Paul on this call. Um, and there's also Dave Palmer, who's uh, not able to join us today. Um, but we're all available to talk about community led housing in all its many forms and varieties. Um, but uh, today I'm mostly going to be talking about housing co ops. Uh, but just to let you know, there are other types of community led housing that you can get involved with. Um, so I've been doing this job for about a year now. And uh, when I had my interview, uh, Joe, who is now my line manager and uh, listening to this conversation, so I better do well, um, uh, asked me what experience I had in uh, community led housing. I'm just putting my phone away because it's. Uh, calling at me um, and that was a kind of fairly easy question to answer because I've been living for five years in a housing co-op and previous to that I was in uh, what we would now call a co-housing project um, but we didn't call it that at the time at the Centre for Alternative Technology uh, so I, w I lived and worked uh, well I lived I worked for the centre for about 20 years and lived in the site community for about two of those years. And I also, as a manager of the co-op, I was responsible for looking after the houses on site. Uh, and I was also a kind of tenant um, spokesperson for the site at some point from the other uh, side of things. Uh, I've also been a landlord. Um, I owned my own house for a while, um, which I was trying to sell for about three years. And rather than seeing it empty during that time, I became a landlord and sat the, um, uh, the, the, the license test that you have to take in Wales. For those of you outside Wales, if you want to be a landlord in Wales, then you uh, have to um, take a Rent Smart Wales uh, online exam and have a license, which I think is actually a really positive thing to do. Uh, so I kind of coming at it from a, a different perspectives really um, and then I kind of felt a bit deeper about the question and realized that I had also a lot of collateral experience of housing just because I'm alive and I've lived for 50 years and I've had uh, many sort of uh, the, the, the life I've led has led me to um, live in many different types of housing situations. And I think uh, this is a really important question to think about if you're thinking of moving into a housing co-op or thinking of setting one up, is what is your housing background? What's your housing story? Where do you come from? Why are you wanting to set up a housing co-op now? Um, and, and what about the other people you're living with or want to live with? Uh, what's their housing background and why? what's their motivations? I think these are really important questions to ask at the beginning of your kind of journey into co-op housing uh, and it's really good to have those conversations at the beginning because once you've settled into the house and moved in and you're living together then some of those housing issues that you've experienced in the past might play on how you relate to each other um, because they kind of can housing to as we probably all know uh, to a great extent can determine um, your outlook on life and uh, what opportunities you've had in life uh, and the way you might uh, approach scarcity or, or uh, wealth or, or the, the different kind of experiences you've had. Some people come into community-led housing with some horror stories about housing that they're also dealing with. And I think this is all really relevant in the process of setting up groups. So to use myself as an example, I just wanted to go through uh, kind of my housing story a little bit. Um, so by the age of five, I had already lived in six homes. Uh, that's because uh, I had quite a precarious start. I guess my mum and dad uh, divorced when I was quite young, uh, age two, I think. And uh, the result of that was the breakup of the family home and having to find temporary accommodation and go back and stay with relatives and then uh, so on and so forth. My mum was a full time teacher bringing up two children alone, uh, which has obviously influenced my life in many different ways and um, has had a big impact on the kind of housing I'd say that I've had access to. Um, by the time I was at university, 
Um, I'd already lived in 10 homes, and that's because uh, when my grand died at uh, age 11, we moved to Lincolnshire and had a, a, a kind of very different experience uh, there. And then uh, the, the, the picture that you can see in the 10 homes is my first experience of communal housing, I guess, living with students, which is what a lot of people think of when they think of housing co-ops, or they think of like hippie commune or uh, the uh, Swedish film together or something like that um, and of course there's a wide variety of different types of housing co-ops and community-led housing um, which I'll talk a bit about later and if you go to other countries uh, then the experience of cooperative housing is actually very different and there's uh, it's much more widespread and there's many more reasons for that people uh, go into co-op housing um, and it's much more common so 13 homes uh, takes me to Wales. Uh, I moved here when I was 24. And uh, I, worked, I lived, as I said, at the Centre for Alternative Technology. And the first home I lived in there was uh, billed as the most energy efficient house in Europe at the time. Sorry, I just nudged my um, presentation in the wrong direction. Um, and uh, um, moving on from there, uh, I moved out of CAT and lived in Houses very similar to the one you see in the middle there, uh, a, a kind of a difficult to heat, drafty Welsh uh, working class cottage. Uh, this is a quarrier's cottage. And this is a, like a common experience for, for people who don't have access to uh, wealth, I think, in Wales. Um, they, we live in what I would politely call heritage houses maybe or legacy houses uh, but are actually uh, built by people who maybe didn't want to spend that much money or people who didn't have that much money and they're certainly not designed uh, really in the way we'd want to live now so what are the motivations i think for uh, communal living and cooperative housing community-led housing is to create create homes that help us move away from that sort of situation which can be quite damaging to health uh, the house, I think, on my screen, the top right hand corner, the White House with the blue uh, windows, uh, was a house I owned. Um, I lived there for about 10 years. It was a house I bought with a partner. Unfortunately, that relationship broke down and I ended up moving out of that house for a while and uh, had a period of homelessness um, and then moved back into it uh, when my partner decided to move somewhere else. Um, but after about 10 years of living there alone, I was starting to feel quite a lot of isolation and loneliness. Uh, and I moved into the house on the bottom right hand uh, corner, uh, which is number 28 of the homes I've lived in over my lifetime. So it, what I'm saying in this story is that housing is quite a precarious situation. And I think I've gone through uh, many of the reasons that people actually want to move into a co-op house or community-led house uh, because they want uh, greater stability, because they want affordable housing, uh, because they want to increase the amount of space they have or move into a, a better quality of home, uh, because they have been lonely and they want to live with other people. I mean, there are other reasons uh, for setting up a community-led housing project. Uh, there are people who set it up for other people, for example, I'm working with a group in Aberystwyth who are trying to uh, set up a house for old people. Uh, and then there are just groups of friends who get together and see a house that they'd really like to buy and they move in. And then like co-housing is a different thing again uh, with a, a different kind of uh, reason for doing what they do. Some people set up housing co-ops for political reasons uh, because they want to uh, change the housing system. Uh, or because they, uh, they they want to answer a social need. Um, so there are lots of different reasons for doing it. And I, that's why I think it's good to, to have those conversations like at the start as you're getting going. I just want to take you, take you back to that first home, uh, which is uh, one agricultural cottages. And as I say, I'd already been in five houses before this. This was number six. And this was a tied house. And it was tied to a uh, national children's home. So my mum was a teacher working full time. And uh, this was where we lived. Uh, and, uh, and the picture on the, uh, on the bottom 
part of the screen there is how it looked in Victorian era. This is a house that has been going, had been going for quite some time and it is a house for people who didn't have homes, who were orphans or couldn't go back to their home because they had difficult family backgrounds. So from quite an early age I had this experience and this sense that uh, other people um, had a very different kind of home life uh, and their home was this place and I, I and it was also a community I uh, spent seven years there and I remember it incredibly fondly uh, having very many great times with the children who lived there and the other teachers and workers in the community and because again it was quite isolated uh, it's a village about seven miles away from Bolton um, it felt like we had our own sequence of events going on there our summer fairs our winter celebrations and so on and so forth Mm. Um, I left that, we left that to move to Lincolnshire, as I said, when my grand died. And um, I didn't, I forgot about it. I didn't go back there. And uh, then eventually I started looking into what happened to this place. Uh, it's called Edgeworth Children's Home. You can look it up online. Uh, and I found out that it had actually stopped being a home and it had become derelict. And uh, I kind of sharing these slides really also as an illustration that as, as well that people, their lives change and evolve and, and, and in the different circumstances and buildings do too. And the use of buildings changes. And there's a certain point where community groups can get involved in the use of buildings um, to change the purpose. And I think like this is an example, uh, a derelict place that a community group could have got involved with. For whatever reason, it didn't happen. The community wasn't there. And eventually it was sold to a developer and now if you want to live in this community you have to have a million pounds uh, <laughs> or at least for some of those houses and that is the house on the far right of that picture i think if you're sharing the same screen view as i am and it has some sort of swimming pool or pond uh, but that's more or less the view from uh, my old uh, one agricultural cottages um so i've kind of putting this up to illustrate that community groups do have uh, chances uh, to take possession of places and if we don't then other people will so when i'm talking about my job i talk about communities creating homes it's not just about building homes and there's plenty of empty houses in wales where that kind of opportunity um, does exist if we can put all the different pieces together to make it work. So taking up to back to where uh, I am now, and um, I'm just gonna admit somebody who's waiting. Uh, so this is me in Machancliff. Um, for those of you who don't know Machancliff, um, we're a small town in Wales, in mid Wales. Uh, it's about 2000 residents. Uh, we're now probably most well known for being the home of Machancliff Comedy Festival. Um, and uh, some of you may even have been, uh, or the uh, we have a Al Sueno uh, festival every couple of years as well, celebration of Victor Hara, or you might have come here on holiday or to visit Cat. I don't know. But this is our town. Uh, we're quite a close knit community, as you can probably tell from that picture, quite a small place. And uh, the, the two housing co um, so uh, the, the, the place I live is Machuncliff Housing Co op. Uh, there are uh, different housing co-ops in Mac, but uh, this is uh, the one that I'm part of. And this is a snap from our website. And the hashtag living the dream is uh, sometimes used ironically when things are not going so well. Uh, but on the whole, uh, we do believe we have a pretty good life together. And uh, you can go and visit our website. Uh, it's there, uh, mac.coop. Uh, uh, it's really easy to find. Or just Google um, Hunkliff Housing Co-op uh, and it will come up. And our two houses are at two ends of the town. Uh, there's one smiley face there and one smiley face. And there's 11 smiley faces in the house in total. Um, there's six in one of the houses and uh, five in, uh, one in our, the house that I'm in at the moment. And that number does change depending on uh, relationships and, uh, and situations where other people are room sharing and so on and so forth and uh, well, sometimes we have uh, temporary uh, guests who stay with us uh, as a kind of temporary housing solution because maybe they're having some uh, issue housing issues of their own that they're, uh, they're having to resolve. Um, this is one of the house, the house that I live in and uh, this is the other house uh, and uh, if 
anybody fancies using the chat function um, uh, as a test, if you haven't used it before, and you can name the Shakespeare play where that quote comes from, then uh, please feel free to do so. Um, uh, just a, a little joke I, I felt like putting in. Um, so we are two households, and this word household has become um, really kind of has an extra significance during this lockdown period because uh, this picture uh, that is taken of us all uh, was taken at our annual general meeting and um, we um, cannot do that anymore. We cannot stand so close to each other because uh, we're from two different households and we can't have meetings together. So like all people in this situation, uh, we're now having Zoom meetings. Uh, we have a meeting every month that's carrying on and uh, but we can't have a shared meal anymore because it's kind of a bit difficult eating together and doing zoom at the same time although i'm sure some people are doing it uh, but we've chosen not to do that but this kind of sense of community is still there but um, we're very much kind of isolated like everybody else from one another and uh, that may change. Uh, we've got announcements in Wales coming up today of some different rules. We have different rules to England, so uh, you can't come and visit us, unfortunately, at the moment, and that's likely to stay in place for the time being. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we are, um, as houses, uh, we are very much looking after one another, and then we're available to the other people in the house if they want to have a chat about anything and that's how it's worked all the time we've existed uh, and we try and keep the social aspect together as much as possible i'll go on to talk about the structure of how that works in a little while um but uh yeah those those are the guys who i i live with uh, so what I really love about the kind of community aspect of the housing is because we're already a community focused housing project, uh, the barriers between the private space and the communal space in the sense of the wider town uh, is uh, a bit looser than it would be, say, if these spaces were private spaces. Uh, for example, we have a, we did have a bike workshop in our garage. Uh, until it got a bit big to carry on being there and uh, that's moved elsewhere but people come into the space that we have and they can fix their bicycles we had a and still do have a, a really good um, bike mechanic who can who can uh, sort your bikes out there's uh, somebody dropping in for a bit of cider making there i think that's the picture going on i was trying to work what work out what that was uh in the other house and then it also in the other house there's uh, we have a thing called schmishmas uh, which i doubt very much will be happening uh this year uh which is quite sad but we uh cram 100 people into uh a house there uh, for a christmas celebration everybody brings food along and um yeah we, we extend our welcome to the whole uh, community to come in or as many people as we can fit uh, as you can see, the house that I live in has quite a big garden and uh, again, this has been used as a kind of micro business for community growing at one point. We're now mostly growing for the house and any surplus is made available to people locally, uh, like we, we leave strawberry plants out for people and we give food to uh, any kind of, at the moment, anybody. Uh, if, the, if we have a surplus, then we'll be passing on food to people who might need it in the community. Um, so I think that's one of the things that, to think about when you're setting up a housing co-op or any sort of community-led housing is what sort of impact you can have for the wider community as well. Um, we're also um, uh, been uh, like involved in the response here in Machancliff to, to Corona. Uh, we're one of the hub hotlines that people can phone if they need to get uh, any shopping or if they need medicine picked up, any vulnerable people who need that help can give us a call. Uh, so, yeah, we, we extend the idea of community beyond ourselves. And I think that's a really important thing to think about when you're setting up one of these projects. So the house where I live, uh, as you can probably tell from that picture, we've been uh, busy during lockdown making a pond. Uh, it's, it is filled with water now. Uh, that's Julio uh, kind of testing it out. Um, and uh, my other housemates are, are Beck, uh, Julio, Sean, and Hattie, you can see in the picture. And the, the picture uh, down there in the corner is uh, some, some of the people might recognize the person in that picture um, as uh, George Monbiot, who's a um, 
Guardian journalist, and um, some of you might even be on this call because you um, saw his tweet about my video that I made about us during the lockdown. Uh, it's important to talk about George because he's an important part of the story. The house does belong to him. Um, he was selling the house and uh, Beck, who was a lodger at the time, so under British law, uh, uh, you can only have two lodgers in your house at any one time. Uh, but if it's a housing co-op, you can accommodate more people. Uh, so Beck's plan was to ask George, uh, as the house was being underused because he was no longer living in it, uh, whether we could uh, turn it into a housing co-op. And for a while, he uh, almost sold it to somebody, but decided to actually that what he wanted to do was to help us set up the co-op, uh, which I think, um, you know, all praise to George for doing that. Uh, and uh, so we have uh, a type of structure uh, that's called a leasehold tenancy. And I'll go on uh, to talk about that uh, now. Uh, so I'm going to put some words up now. Uh, it's a leasing model of housing co-ops. Um, so as I say, a leasehold tenancy. And that means that we have a lease that we've agreed with George uh, that's uh, over a long period and it's five years and this it's quite a detailed lease uh, and it explains the kind of who's responsible for what the lease fee that we have to pay every year what rights and duties landlord and the co-op has it also has uh, in it uh, what we call break points and break points are um, allow the co-op or george to pull out of the agreement if it should be necessary and there's a certain period of notice within that but we haven't needed to do that. And we've now got an extended lease for another four years. Uh, Casey, I just noticed we're getting a few questions coming in. Is there anything that needs answering now? Um, just one from Joe. Um, which house did the co-op establish first? So yeah, I can talk about that now, actually. That's good. Uh, so the other house, uh, well, I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and uh, yeah, this was the second house. Uh, so the other house already existed and they had a similar arrangement to the one that we had in that the um, the people who bought the house were no longer living in, in it they were two brothers uh, but and they had um, they had uh, lodges and they weren't able to live there anymore so then they decided to set it up as a cow as a housing co-op and that happened about a year before we set our house up uh, so they had done all the hard work, basically. Uh, actually, it's not too demanding setting up a housing co-op, but there is some work involved. And uh, the Wales Co-op Centre helped um, Huncliffe Housing Co-op get started and provided a lot of the initial advice uh, for when the other house uh, set up as a co-op. Uh, so they leased for about five years, uh, like we're doing, and then the owners of that house said they definitely want to sell. Uh, and uh, I'll go on to talk about what's happened with that in a moment. Um, and just a question from me, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Was, were the landlords aware of co-op models or did it take some doing to convince them to do this? Or you know, were they quite on board with it in the first place? So uh, speaking for George, he was very on board with it. He did know about co-op models and he'd visited some in the past. Uh, and he was very keen to support it as a community-led housing project. And in fact, he asked us if we wanted to buy it at the start, and we would have liked to have done that, but we weren't really in a position to do that. And we also, as new people coming to live together, we weren't ready to buy it as a co-op. Uh, so we felt it was better to actually go down the lease model to get experience of co-op living, uh, to work out how this whole thing worked, and then be ready um, when and if the opportunity came up to buy it again. And we will have that opportunity in two and a half years because George uh, doesn't want to have the house forever. And we have to now work out a way of, uh, of bringing the pieces together to uh, be able to buy the house. And one of the issues around housing generally is the capitalization of houses. Uh, so we could afford to do it if the house was about £200,000 on an affordable co-op housing model uh, with, say, five different rooms available for rent in the house. 
uh, but the house is worth about three hundred thousand pounds so uh, there's a there's a gap there and we need to work out how to do that and that might be about individuals putting in a contribution themselves uh, to make it all work uh, but that's a slightly different kind of housing model and it does raise questions about uh, is it still affordable then for other people if people have to uh, bring in some some of their own capital so there's generally a long-term issue with the housing market there um, I mean, there is talk about with the coronavirus about house prices going down, uh, which might be the case, um, but we don't know yet. And um, certainly there are some, uh, the, the Wales Co-op Centre is working on some financing models to make it easier for people to buy into houses. Uh, but I think overall, over time, there has to be a shift in the, in the way house values work for, for people. Just a quick question from Alison. I think you can answer this pretty quickly. Cool. Um, are the two houses um, part of the same co-op or are they separate? Yes, so they are part of the same co-op and I'll go on to talk about that in a moment, how that works. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're the Huncliffe Housing Co-op, uh, both houses. Uh, we run things kind of separately uh, in each house, but we also make some decisions together and we have quite a clear process of how we do that. Uh, which I'll, I'll go on to talk about in a moment, I think. Great, we've got some more questions coming in, but I'll come back to you. Yeah, okay, cool, brilliant. Thanks everybody for, for, for sending the questions in, that's great. So, can, I, can I just say something? Frank. Uh, what was the uh, 200 to 300,000? I missed that, so I heard everything else, but I missed sure. the original thing. Sure, so uh, when we, we have a uh, kind of financial model that we're working with, uh, which is provided by Radical Roots um, Co-op, oh. I know that one. Um, and uh, they, uh, the model really suggests that um, affordability in terms of having a rent that's very similar to uh, council house rents or housing association rents um, is uh, you can value if you have, if you're paying about 30,000 to 40,000 for each room in the house, then then you can uh, rent it out for that's just a ballpark figure. Um, but the because this is quite a big house with quite a big garden and it's detached and so on and so forth. And the value of the house is much more than that. Yeah. Uh, and because, because of that, um, we could carry on having an affordable rent if we bought the house, uh, if we rented out five rooms, um, but, um, which we, we could do. Uh, but there's a gap there between the, the, what we would like to pay for the house and the actual value of the house. Uh, That's the difference. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Frank. Uh, so, as I was saying, this uh, like we set the uh, as a, 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 setting up a housing co-op. Uh, one of the big differences uh, than, than if you're just a um, a, uh, a tenant or if you're just a, a lodger in the house, then we are much more kind of hands-on about what we do with the house. We decide who the new members are going to be. We set the budgets, we collect the rents, we manage the garden and we do some maintenance. Uh, so it, it allows you a lot more autonomy about the direction of the house. And I think that's why it's a really useful model. Also because the process of, uh, of running a house democratically, and we do have, we run the whole thing democratically with consensus decision-making. Um, is actually a, like a massive learning experience for people uh, and it, I kind of think it really improves your mental well-being with being able to participate fully in the housing process. So this is the other house, Joe asked the question uh, who came first and as I said uh, this house came first and, and they, they did all the work and they uh, leased uh, for five years um, but now they have bought uh, bought the house, or we, as a as McHuncliffe Housing Co-op, has bought the house. Uh, so this is the owning model, and this is uh, a probably more ideal way, I think, for for most housing co-ops to go in the long term, because then the the house is owned fully by the community and will always be in the hands of the community. Uh, housing co-ops, the legal model model of it is that nobody, no member of a housing co-op can benefit from the sale of a house. So if a, if a housing co-op, and it's very rare that they actually close down, so it's a very secure kind of 
long-term housing model but if it does have to close down for whatever reason then the house is sold and the money any money remaining from that house sale goes to another housing co-op which is nominated uh, by the the housing co-ops that's closing down uh, so it stays within the cooperative movement and no member of the housing co-op can profit from the sale of that or from any aspect of its work. And that's a, a kind of really important fundamental principle. This also means that uh, residents, members, can access a kind of home ownership uh, even though they themselves cannot get hold of a mortgage. Uh, because the mortgage is held by the business it is a business uh, and it's called a business mortgage the mortgage that you have to get and ours is from the uh, ecology building society um, and uh, so the the ownership rests with the co-op and not with the individuals and that means that the individuals can't be held responsible for any kind of um for, for, for the any the sale of the house or anything like that so that the responsibility i mean you have legal responsibilities still for the running of the house uh, but in terms of debt you are not liable for that debt and that allows uh, banks and mortgage companies to lend to the business and not to the individuals where they you know people who are on a low income for example or a certain age uh, cannot get hold of a mortgage so we acquired that house, we bought it uh, by taking out a mortgage uh, and we got a deposit for the mortgage uh, using a thing called loan stock, uh, which I'm not gonna go into massive detail about here because there's quite a lot of complexities about it. But this is a system that allows you to offer an investment opportunity to people. And it is an investment opportunity. You are giving people a return on their investment. Um, and they, there's also a kind of flexibility within it. Uh, that you can offer people the opportunity to take a 0% return or a 1 or 2, 3% return, um, but they have to invest for a minimum of five years. We set that rate at a £1,000 investment and they can't get their money back for five years, but over that time they get the interest from it. Um, so that's the way that you can get your deposit for the mortgage. Uh, but as I say, I won't go into the detail of it all at the moment because there's quite a lot of complexities. And certainly when you're building your financial model, you have to work out how you're going to pay that money back eventually. And that all comes into. And so it isn't free money. Uh, it isn't money that allows you to do something that's not possible. Um, but it allows you to get hold of that mortgage, which uh, is kind of makes things happen. As I said, uh, members, we don't own any part of the house or have debt liabilities for the business. So we are one fully mutual housing co-op. Um, only residents can be members of fully mutual housing co-ops uh, and only members can be residents. Um, mm -hmm. So this is different to a, a kind of a, a thing like um, a community land trust. Uh, where you might well have other people involved in your project. Um, and uh, uh, we have the say over the house, and only we do, um, apart from the agreements that we have, obviously, with our landlord. Our value fully mutual. <clears throat> uh, so we are, a run, we are run as a business, and... Uh, to be a housing co-op, you have to be registered with the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA for short, and that's a bit of the paperwork that you have to do. Uh, but they, the reason for that is that um, you are, I mean, it's a good thing because it, it, it makes sure that you manage your accounts well. It makes sure that you're keeping uh, your, your um, rents on track and uh, you know, it, it ultimately ensures that you don't close down as a co-op because you've you've mismanaged it. Uh -huh. uh, so decisions are made democratically, as I said. We have monthly and annual general meetings using consensus. Uh, the only amount of money you have to have to join our housing co-op at the moment is a one pound share, uh, which is a normal amount, and and that means that you pay that over and you become a member of the co-op. Uh, there is a kind of whole process of becoming a member of the co-op, um, which we have um, a whole kind of secondary rule process, which I'll go on to talk about in a minute. Um, uh, so, but in, in the actual commitment that you have to make financially is just one pound. 
Casey, I'm seeing a lot more questions coming in. Do I need to stop now? And <laughs> yeah, if that's a good place to stop. Cool. Uh, so we've got a question from Amelia um, about the legal differences about the the lodges and the co-op that you mentioned. So you can't have more than two lodges. Um, but if you if you set up that co-op um, structure, that's fine. And then about the HMO um, license as well around those issues and whether there's a difference in England and Wales. So as far as I know, with the HMO uh, licensing, there isn't a difference between England and Wales in the sense that um, in um, housing co-ops, you are a, a, you're regarded as a household, as a family. Um, so in some sense it, like if you're if you have lodgers in they are not regarded as your family members uh, and you can only have two of them in and if you have more than that then you would have to go to a house of multiple occupancy kind of status which means that you would have to register with your local authority and there would be certain checks uh, that people would have to carry out but in as a principle um following some of those hmo uh, obligations is a really good thing uh, so for example you and you would have to do anyway uh, as a as a membership organization so fire safety checks uh, sorry fire fire safety checks and doing every year your gas safety checks every year um, making sure that you're meeting those kind of health and safety requirements um, but it does the difference is between the lodges and the housing co-op is that uh, we've been uh, it's enabled us to have uh, more people in the house than we would have had if it was just lodges and um, so we freed up two rooms that were used very irregularly uh, and they're now fully occupied so we've provided um, accommodation that wasn't available before and that might be the case in other houses um, you know I know that like many older many people because of changing circumstances um, find themselves in houses that are too big for them and this may be a way around uh, of if they don't want to give up ownership of the house uh, then uh, allowing a housing co-op to be there over a period of time may be an option some right. more questions case uh, yeah. and then we've sorry i've uh, got a question from ailsa if you want to unmute yourself ailsa hi thanks um hi alan um hi. yeah just Really interested. I mean, it sounds like we're in a similar-ish situation, possibly like the, that you were when you were started. I mean, when we um, are chatting with our landlord about the possibility of this house, which he wants to sell, turning into a co-op. I mean, it's not for sure yet, but it's it's a conversation that we're having with him, and um, just would love some clarification about how the leasing works and. I, and I'd always wondered how it worked with George there and and how what the kind of official agreement was and so am I right in thinking so the, the lease means that you're during the lease period you're still paying rent to him but there's a mutual agreement that you've that you've written and agreed together and then when that lease is over he'll decide whether he wants to sell it to the co-op or sell it to someone else or keep it himself and kind of renew that um, yeah so we pay what's called a lease fee and then we as members have to work out how we pay that lease fee uh, between us and that means working out what rent we need to pay every month uh, and then on top of that we have uh, what we call a bills pot because obviously we have to pay the council tax the utilities and so on and so forth so we've also had to calculate the budget for that um, the lease is for five years originally and then was extended for another four years and George has included in that lease uh, a um, first refusal offer to the housing co-op um, so it's part of the legal agreement that if he does decide to sell at any point that he will offer the offer it to the housing co-op first I mean it, it will be based on market rates I don't think there's any way of getting around that um, but um, yeah, it gives, he's actually said that he does want to sell in a few years time uh, and that gives us an opportunity to think about how we're going to do it. Mm. But I can, uh, I, I can talk to you in loads more depth uh, later, Elsa, and uh, yeah, let's fix up a meeting and really happy to chat. That'd be brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, what were you saying?
uh, that it was a solution for an older person who lives in a large house. How would that work? Uh, so, oh, I see what you mean. Uh, so if there's a person who's uh, living alone in a larger house and um, they want to move somewhere else, uh, but maybe they don't want to uh, sell the house for whatever reason, uh, because they, maybe they want to leave it to family or oh, something like that. They can do what George did. They could do something similar to George, yeah. Um, they can't they can't actually they I, we're investigating whether it's possible to still live in a house and, and rent it to a housing car lease it to a housing huh. car but we're yeah. not sure it is at the moment really yeah it's, it's difficult because uh power power relations <laughs> it's nice if the landlord's away because it's uh you know it's power isn't it you know they say oh there, know, there, you know, there are some attachment. Yeah, there's definitely <laughs> some issues around that yeah yeah um but I mean, mostly, I think this has been a really creative relationship between the co-op and George, and it's been well, well, uh, pretty I'm, good. I know George from 2004, and um, um, he won't be. I wouldn't imagine that he'd be particular, particularly liking being a landlord, given that landlordism, colonialism, you know, is landlordism basically. So well, the whole history of humanity is is uh, people been forced to work for money because they haven't got the land, had the land taken away from them by the, the big landlord and you got all these little landlords you know that copy the big landlord you know as they copy the it, front it, room it carries on doesn't it it carries yeah. on doesn't it frank That's so it. Uh, yes yeah, so he wouldn't be sitting easily with him i wouldn't have thought no yeah. uh okay thank you thanks frank for that yeah. um i'll yeah. um question from Colin as well about the, the responsibilities in terms of um, repairs and maintenance so is that the landlord's responsibility or is that the co-op's responsibility? So it's set down in the lease and it's a, a variant so uh, the landlord is responsible for what we would call the big things so like any structural issues with the house uh, replacing the roof uh, for example uh, and then things like fixing plumbing issues um, uh, electric so on and so forth so you know that's stated in the lease that he's responsible for all those things uh, and that there has been some major work done over this time and as a co-op uh, some of that work was unexpected uh, so there's an important question there about budgeting and about making sure that you have uh, budgeted correctly uh, to deal with those uh, sudden emergency things. Now, we haven't had to do that, leasing it for this period, because George has been putting the money in back into the house uh, to make sure those repairs are carried out. Some things we are responsible for. Uh, so the things, the little things, I guess, uh, things like, I mean, it's quite, it's not that little because it's quite a big garden, but the garden maintenance, the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, we're responsible for decoration in the house. Uh, so we've um, doing, doing painting and decorating and so on and so forth. Uh, we're responsible for things that we break, I guess, so, or uh, things that we block up. So if we have a plumbing thing that we've caused, then we'd kind of be responsible for sorting it out. Uh, so that's all laid down in quite good detail in the, uh, in the uh, agreement that we have. Uh, there's a, we have a polytunnel here. Uh, that's potentially quite a big expense for us. If the polytunnel fabric rips, then we have to replace that. Uh, and uh, so far, touch wood, that hasn't happened. Um, hmm. The polytunnel is 10 years old now. So as those yeah. of you who maybe have polytunnels will know that uh, there's a lifetime on those on that fabric. 10 years. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, yeah. So we've had to keep aside a pot of money um, in our budget to make sure we can cover that if that happens but george would pay for the frame of that to be replaced uh, so those are the kind of um things uh, we've got niall raising a hand hello hi niall hi uh, yeah thanks for that talk's very interesting uh, i'm in a housing co-op in east london in newham long life and i'm the chair of that co-op and we are fully mutual which I think is the best model, but it, it was easier to do in the 70s and 80s to establish such co-ops when there's local authority grants and so on, which were taken away by the Margaret, the Thatcher government in the past. Yeah. And then the, la the cost of land is a big problem as well. Uh, but uh, and my housing co-op, I mean, it's gone through different problems. You know, when I joined in 2007, 
it was on, it was on the point of being shut down by the regulator because of governance and management problems. So we were all thrown into the deep end and had to take officer positions and keep the thing on board. So it was a bit of a quick learning uh, curve for me and my partner. But um, you know we've kept it we've kept it going, and in two or three years' time we'll have paid off all our mortgages, and we'll own own our own properties, which is a big achievement. We're the last one really co op in this part of uh, East London. But um, I just uh, wonder uh, what you do in your co op from the point of view of education and you know and co op ethos, ideas, and history, and so on, because uh, to me it's that's, that's a crucial issue to getting young people involved, and that really you know. It, it, in my, in my experience across London, the activists in the co-op movement, the housing co-op movement, tend to be older. Uh, I'm, in the, I'm an executive of the London Federation of Housing Co-ops. I'm 52 and I'm the youngest. <laughs> so there is a problem there. And in our housing, our housing co-op, we've gone out of, out of our way to get the younger people involved. So we've got like a young guy who's about 22 on the co-op and we've had younger people as well. And it, it can be difficult. It can be intimidating for them, working with people around for a long time. I know it's different in your situation, a bit different because it's a smaller co-op uh looks younger to me <laughs> than ours it is uh, you know going by the pictures and so on so it's probably easier but i think even with that i think one thing we have sort of lost in the movement over the last number of years is the origins of housing co-ops historically where it comes from the whole cooperative movement which is part of the general working class mm-hmm. movements and labor movements the ethos of co-ops you know why, why we exist you know and countering some of the prejudices that you mentioned at the start that people might have of housing co-ops uh, so just wondering what your do, do, do you run educational sort of meetings or anything or small numbers but maybe you don't have to make it too formal perhaps you can it's more of an informal thing for yourselves yeah i mean we do informally talk to a lot of people about the housing co-op locally i mean obviously i'm doing this job now and that's really helpful in terms of getting uh, fulfilling that kind of education um, part of it um we do have a um uh, we have things like uh, every week we have a thing called um, Mac Speak, um, which is Machancliffe Speak, and, and people can go along and give presentations. And I've given presentations there about the work that I'm doing. Um, and I think generally um, people are sharing lots of conversations with people informally about the housing co op. And as I say, inviting people to come into it. I think uh, you're right in the sense that. We don't put a huge amount of time in it as individuals, uh, like apart from informally. Um, And I think part of that is probably to do with uh, the fact that running a co-op does take extra time. uh, And then to add in time on top of that, uh, to go out and talk to people uh, is an ask for people. Now, some people do go along to the, Uh, radical roots conferences and to other events and things to talk about housing co-ops but I definitely think uh, you're right I've got a slide in a moment about the values uh, and where it comes from uh, and uh, we follow those values but those part of it um, yeah I think uh, we're probably generally as a co-op movement not doing enough of uh, and we're in the Wales Co-op Centre trying to answer some of those problems I mean, it's more specifically in Wales. I know there are other institutions also uh, in in England that are doing that. Uh, But I think you're right. There there kind of maybe has been a shift away from uh, some of those early values. But in terms of um, the young, the age of people involved in the housing co-op, I'm 50 and I'm the oldest person in the housing co-op. And the youngest person is 25, 26. We have had younger than that. Um, generally I've been the oldest person uh, by um, five or ten years I think and sometimes there has been people closer to my age and uh, sometimes less so Um, but that's been really interesting for me because it's uh, obviously I'm learning a lot from younger people and uh, and and where the places that they've come from and that's been a really um, really nice kind of shared experience uh, uh, from being around younger people uh, and learning some of the things that they're coping with at this time. Uh, do we have more questions, Casey? We do. Do you want to take them now? Uh, if they're relevant to now, then I can do. Yeah, so we've got um, a question around the, the lease. So do you and the landlord set all of the terms of the lease yourself? Um, or are there national requirements defined in law that need to be met by both parties, essentially? That was from Marcus. So um, we 
do have a conversation about the lease and we've done that uh we did at the beginning and uh so I, the lease uh came from george originally and it will have some legal uh commitments uh, legal standards that you would find in lease agreements and then we've negotiated certain parts of the lease and most of it I, I have to say we're entirely happy with i think it's a good arrangement and it's not to our disadvantage um it takes a bit of looking at and a bit of reading through um but you know and some of it is legalese which is a bit of an issue sometimes for people i think uh, but uh on the whole i think it works pretty well for both parties um in the situation that we wanted at the time um and sorry what was the other part of that question um so are there national requirements basically that you have to meet that are defined in law or is it is it just a case of you and the landlord come into that agreement so there are other national requirements that are defined by and i was going to come on to talk about that in a minute uh, defined by uh, what are known as model rules uh, which have to be adopted by all housing co-ops and they do have a, a set of legal requirements that you have to fulfill and they're there they're all there for very good reasons and some of it is about the culture of cooperative living about being democratic about being accountable about being open and so on and so forth uh, and uh, so i don't see those as a barrier to anything i see those as a really helpful guide uh, then the, the lease is something different with George and then we have our, the, our own relationship with each other uh, which is also set down in what we call secondary rules uh, what the co-op movement calls secondary rules uh, so these are more bespoke to each individual housing co-op and they're, they're created uh, together as a community uh, and they may we may we're going through a process over about a year or so now where we've been uh, refining those secondary rules and coming up with new ones and we're going to hopefully make those available through the wales craft center at some point as a guide for other people but i would say that it's really important for community groups to uh reflect on those maybe but come up with their own uh, about because the, the secondary rules is more about how you want to live as a group of people uh, but some of those secondary rules are really important like uh um uh like uh, how you're going to communicate with one another whether you're going to have a disciplinary procedure um although we probably wouldn't call it that because that's kind of the wrong sort of word in that yeah. sort of situation uh, but more about how you want to live with each other um yeah so I'll, I'll go on to talk a little bit about that i think in the next slide uh, is there anything else casey yeah we've just got a couple of questions on membership so i'll put them to you um, both together so we've got one from rosalyn about have you opened up the membership to members who are prospective tenants um and then one from sam about the process of accepting new members um, if a room were to become available so no is the question is the answer to the question we don't have like a separate uh candidature to a list or or kind of members who are not residents so that's the answer to the first question uh, the second is that we have quite a detailed um, secondary rule about recruitment um, that encourages us to uh, share uh, widely in the community and in and outside the community that places are available in the housing co-op and we set up a kind of set of principles about making sure that uh, different groups who we might not naturally be in contact with uh, find out about a, a housing place so we try and make that as open as possible um, obviously when people come to be members of a existing co-op um, it is uh, to a certain extent um, how you will get on with those existing people um, but we use criteria like if there's an immediate housing need as well we try and feed that into the discussion um, and so we're not just offering it to friends um, that, that, and that does work that has happened we've brought in people that we don't know and uh, um, yeah so yeah that's I think that's really I mean you can set up a housing cult with just three people and just have your close mates in there there's absolutely nothing wrong with that um, but as you grow as you change as, as you you might want to redefine your purpose uh, you might want to make it more available to more people you might want to uh, make sure that people are included uh, that, that can't have access to this because there is kind of potentially a lot of 
privilege uh, that uh, can feed into these systems. And it's something that Niall touched on, I think, there in, in terms of communicating to a wider group of people. Um, you know, there are people that may be excluded because they don't have access um, to certain things or certain pieces of information. Certainly kind of looking at my own childhood and my own life, I come from that place of not being, uh, not knowing about housing co-ops uh, until I came to CAT and not knowing that that kind of structure existed. Um, yeah, whereas some people are already in it, they already know about housing co-ops, they've maybe come from one already, uh, they've come from that background, um, they may be activists who are talking to other activists. Um, so yeah, I think there's, it's in, we felt that it was important to put a bit, a bit more kind of weight around how we made those decisions about recruitment. Great. Have, have you seen in your experience, um, I can't find the word for it, uh, like that, that um, big house that you lived in became exclusive or became went very much up market. Have you seen any housing courts go um, up market and become exclusive, you know, excluding basically, um, or, you know, high priced tenancies and stuff? So, yeah. yeah, well, I was going to talk about this in a bit. There's a model of um, housing co-op where you uh, have to have a have a share to buy into it, a loan stock share. Um, and um, there's one near here, um, which is called Dockley's um, co-housing project, where you actually have to have a certain amount of capital to join the housing co-op. And it's because it's a large house and the individual flats within the house so it's more like a co-housing project and to buy into it i can't remember the exact figure but it's something like i think 180,000 pounds which uh basically does exclude some people um but it, it's they can't get around that problem now now it used to be possible to get a mortgage to buy in on that sort of system into housing co-ops um, but since the financial crash you can't do that anymore uh, so those people who are moving into that place have to have capital, which means that they already have to have sold somewhere else to be able to, to move in. Uh, so, mm. But I wouldn't exactly call it up market as such, no. because, um, but uh, it's definitely the case that you need capital to be there. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, other people might have other, other knowledge of, of housing courts where that's happened. Uh, but generally, the rental model, where you're just paying a rent every month, uh, in my experience, seems to manage to keep the affordability model going. Yeah, yeah, because it's just a home. You kind of, you, you're probably looking to um, to have, have the best best home at the lowest cost. If you like, you're not really looking at to, to making it a, into a business, are you? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I mean, I'd like, say yeah. I'd say the primary motivation for living in a housing co-op situation is that you want to be with people and make decisions together. Because that's true. That's there, very true. There kind is an issue. Against the grain, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there is an issue about like if you are moving to a place just because it, of a certain way it is, uh, and yeah. then uh, yeah, then, then that's that can cause problems, and it has I think in some communities. I'm going to move on. Casey, you had a question. Yeah, just a really uh, quick secondary question from Rosalyn um, is that you don't, do you not have a waiting list um, for people when places become available? We don't currently have a waiting list. Um, I mean, maybe we should do. Um, and that's something that we could, I could, yeah, feed back to the co-op. Off the top of my head, I can't remember if we've discussed it before or not. Um, we tend to uh make an open application i mean even if we had a waiting list we would still make it an open application uh, because people's circumstances change and we want to still make it as as wide as possible thank you thank you okay so I, i've realized that i've gone uh well over the hour i said i might talk at the beginning uh or the or less time uh so very quickly um yeah, I just want to reiterate that we're two houses and we have a different decision making process for both houses. Now, housing co ops, as I said, can just be three people living in one house. It could be one house, two houses, any multiples. Some housing co ops in Britain are, have 100 or more houses in, um, mostly in England, actually. Um, 
uh, possibly some in Scotland, I'm not quite sure, but um, those housing co-ops, the large ones, tend to work on a different model because they have to. They probably have like a one member, one vote voting system. They probably have a management committee uh, that probably, I don't know, Niall, the one that, that you're in is probably more like that, possibly. Um, the, uh, that we're a very small co-op, so we can still make all our decisions at monthly general meetings. Uh, and then the annual general meetings has a slightly different function. But we have certain decisions that we make at a house level and certain decisions we make at a co-op level, and those are all defined in our secondary rules. Um, So yeah, I mentioned before about model rules. Uh, don't be put off by the rules. Generally, they're good and they help you and they define what a co-op is uh, and keep keep you to the principle of cooperative living and working. So I think they're a good thing. The model rules are agreed with the Financial Conduct Authority and you can adopt your model rules if you want to, uh, but if you adopt the model rules, then you have to pay a certain amount for each rule that you change and you have to submit them to the FCA and then the FCA has to approve them. So it's a kind of, and the, and the FCA are probably very busy and I don't know how long it takes for you to get those rules apply, rules changed. So if you want to move quickly, uh, then adopt the model rules that are already there because they're great. And uh, you can get model rules from different organizations. Uh, I think we have our own set of model rules that people can access. Um, Case is nodding, and then there are model rules from uh, Radical Roots and uh, probably from the uh, Federation of, of uh, Community and Cooperative Housing uh, in England. Um, so they're there, and, and uh, we can help you find them. Um, but uh, yeah, I kind of I think on the whole recommend that uh, you just go for the model rules, but read them in detail and see what you're signing up to, obviously. Um, and if there's something you really don't agree with, then talk as a as a group to uh, decide whether you want to, to put the time and the extra money into amending them. Uh, secondary rules, uh, as I said, these are ones that we've created ourselves and each co-op uh, will probably want to do that. Um, shared working loads is uh, one that I haven't mentioned um, before in this talk. Uh, so we're going through this process at the moment. I think with housing co-ops, people put in different amounts of work. There are some jobs that everybody has to do, and there are some jobs that we allocate to, or uh, we allocate in a, in a democratic way to specific people. So they're uh, elected at an annual general meeting. That's things like treasurer, maintenance, uh, secretaries, and things like that. Legally, you have to have a named secretary and a named treasurer in the, your relationship with the FCA uh, and you have to put those names on the annual report that you have to submit every year following your AGM. Um, and uh, then there are the guiding principles uh, which uh, Nard talked uh, about earlier which are the seven principles of cooperation and as he so rightly pointed out uh, education, training and information is a big part of that. So helping other people uh, to do the, the thing that you've done, uh, cooperation among cooperatives, concern for your wider community. And then there are the other uh, seven, voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, members economic participation, autonomy and independence. If you Google seven principles of cooperation, these will all come up really quickly and you can read them in more detail. Uh, I haven't really got time to dwell on them all here. There, there is one good thing. Um, an IPS, Industrial and Profit Society, can merge uh, on, a, on a vote. Whereas, you know, the company or uh, unincorporated or an LLP or any other CIC, they've all got to dissolve and then go through all the paperwork to join up with another a company entity. But an IPS can merge. You know, one can merge with the other on a, on a group meeting. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for that information, Frank. That's, that's yeah, really it's a good one because, you know, you can just merge in with other co-ops. So that's if you're... Yeah, that's that's really helpful. I mean, also, like if there's a new house and there's an existing co-op locally, then it is probably worth getting in touch with them and seeing whether that you can be incorporated or you want to be incorporated in, in their co-op mm. because it does save you a lot of time setting something up at the start um, and we, we were really lucky like that so yeah it's important to reiterate uh, i think that you are you are a business as a housing co-op uh, it's uh, not a complicated business but you are 
um, handling your own budget, your, uh, you have to manage your cash flow, you have to set the rents, and you have to collect them, and you need annual accounts and all that stuff. So it's not like owning uh, your own house. There is a kind of certain extra commitments that you, you have to make as part of the housing co-op process. And uh, you kind of have to keep on reviewing those and making sure you're on target and you're not building up debt and that you're uh, putting enough money aside for those rainy day events that I talked about earlier. And also, I mean, we now have responsibilities to investors, so we have to make sure that we have enough money to pay back investors uh, if they should require their loan stock uh, repayments after five years. And then at intervals after that, if they, they can reinvest in the co-op after the five year period, and we're hopeful that some people will do that. But if they want to take their money back, uh, then obviously we have to make sure we've built up the reserves to do that and don't spend that. So we have to ring fence some money in that process. You know, I was talking to one person in the Radical Roots who was saying that when they come to pay back the loan stock after five years, they get somebody else to put some loan stock in and they pay that older person back with a new loan stock. <laughs> so yes, you can do that. You can recycle the money like that. And it, it's uh, it's quite a, a cool thing to do because you're, you're keeping the money within the community. Uh, mm. So yeah, I talked about legal requ requirements earlier. Um, there are other types of uh, models of cooperative um, housing. And I'm just putting these up uh, to illustrate that. I'm not going to talk in depth about it, but you can easily Google and find out. There's Lilac in Leeds, which is a co-housing project. Uh, that has a mutual home ownership uh, system and as I say their members put 35% of their income towards a joint mortgage taken out by the whole co-op. Uh, that's a different an interesting kind of financial model uh, to certainly to kind of help people uh, in the affordability issue. Uh, and then there's stock lease which I also mentioned which is where uh, people own loan stock in the property uh, and then uh, they have to sell their loan stock to someone else when they move out. So again, you can uh, Google them or they're on the uh, UK um, co-housing network uh, website. There's a link there. Okay, so with all communities, uh, there is what some people call the community tax, uh, which is the um, uh, when uh, things are not quite going quite so well or uh, when you're, the, the co-op is maybe not performing as well as you would like it to or there are interpersonal issues uh, this is all takes a bit of time um, but you could also reframe that whole thing as being a learning experience and i've certainly learned a lot from being in this housing cart when things haven't been working out as they should in terms of my own response to situations in, in terms of what i bring to a situation in terms of thinking uh, going back to those earlier that earlier chat I had about thinking about your own housing experience, uh, what was driving me in a particular situation to react in the way I did. So I think um, there are issues around living with other people, obviously, and they'll always be there. Um, but um, I think if you go into it with a kind of open heart and an open mind and think about what you can learn from those experiences, uh, then I, I think uh, it's actually a really great experience for yourself. Yeah, don't, I've learned a lot of stuff. Don't sweat yeah. the small stuff. Uh, sorry, Frank. I'm going to move move on because yeah. um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. uh, we're we're probably coming up to the end of the end of time. Um, so yeah, as I say, you come in with your own habits, your needs, your hang-ups, and some people might have a, might have had very difficult housing stories that they're carrying with them. But everybody brings love, compassion, great ideas, and their own gifts to the situation. So I think it's really important to carry on talking if you come if you come into any difficulties but also have some mechanisms in place for making that easy uh, they could be your monthly meetings they could be extra things that you, you put into place uh, i think keep the conversations going with people and be real about it um, if you're having a hard time or if somebody's making life quite difficult for you then i think it's just better to have an honest conversation about it and if you're holding back from having that then it's probably time to kind of have a look at what's keeping you from those honest conversations. Uh, definitely, there will always be washing up issues. I think like that's one of the issues in our house. Uh, people have different um, ideas about how quickly they want to wash up and, uh, and that's always going to be there. And we've had quite uh, different kind of conversations about how to uh, handle the washing up and have different systems in place. Uh, but some cultural change, change seems very difficult uh, to, to get through. 
and some people will do more work than others and i think you can get hung up about that and we've had different systems in place to kind of try and analyze that and see how we can uh, change that uh, in the end i think a lot of it comes down to what people are told when they join a housing co-op and so we've now uh, created a, a secondary guidance uh, really about what's expected of you when you join a housing co-op that you will need to do some things that are different to if you were just renting or if you were just a lodger uh, and then there are you know the other ways of kind of expressing that you might want to do more work if you haven't been invited to do so i think co-ops it's quite easy to not invite people to participate as well uh, to actually make that active request of people so people are thinking they don't need to do anything because they haven't actually been involved so i think it's really also it's a two-way street and you have to involve people as you're going along and have kind of like uh, introductory meetings and, and guide people helpfully in uh, but do sweat the big stuff because things can go wrong sometimes very badly it could be interpersonal it could be financial and your systems the ones that you've created need to help you with that uh, so i do think you have to spend some time talking as a group preferably be before you move in because once you're embedded in the housing co-op it is kind of harder to have those conversations because you didn't talk about them at the start uh, so although i think the you have to have an ongoing conversation with your housemates. I think it's really important to have some systems in place. And there are different people and groups that can help you with that. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, we certainly uh, will be making kind of some of our secondary rules available to people, I think. And in worst case scenarios, there has to be a mechanism of removing membership from a person. And this is really the last thing you'd want to do in a housing co-op because the whole point of housing co-ops is to provide stable accommodation for people so you really only do this under very difficult circumstances and you, it's only achievable with the agreement uh, really of a substantial majority of the housing co-op and that a particular person is causing uh, so much of a problem in a house situation that they're threatening the co-op in some way and you have to be realistic that that may be a possibility um, and you have to act to protect the co-op because in the end of the day the co-op is more important uh, than an individual member in the co-op uh, because the co-op that survives is providing more accommodation for people over time and and uh, you, you definitely don't want that co-op to close because of the actions of one particular individual at any one moment in time uh, so here's some resources uh, that you can access. Um, we'll try and get these to people, I think, as well, because um, you, you, you can click on now. Um, I'll just leave them up for a moment, but go through them. Uh, I, I made a video about our own lockdown housing experience uh, in our housing co-op in our house. Um, and that's online on YouTube, and that's what it's called, or you could just look up Alan Shepherd Housing and it will come up, or the Communities Creating Homes uh, YouTube channel, uh, which is the name of our program uh, that we're running at the Wales Cooperative Centre. Um, and um, there is a, a famous astronaut called Alan Shepherd, so if you type in Alan Shepherd, you will just come up with videos of him. Uh, but uh, so you, you have to put in housing as well uh, to get through to me. Um, RSA blog, I wrote a blog recently on community-led housing, uh, it's on the RSA website and we'll, I'll certainly make that available uh, I think as well through our own, our own website. There's a blog on, our, on the Wales Co-op website as well that you can read where I'm kind of exploring some of the issues around community-led housing and um, uh, COVID and, and what this period of time could mean for uh for people in community-led housing obviously uh covid is causing a problem for some community groups because they can't get on site they might be halfway through a build they might have definite deadlines uh, that they need to meet and, and they can't fulfill them at the moment um for other groups this might be a great time to to be, if, if you have time uh, set to put some time aside to thinking about what you want from your housing situation um there's our website. Please go online and have a look at our different resources. Um, as I say, Huncliffe Housing Court website, and then I have a website as well where I, where I post things about the house um, and about my work and about a few other things too. Uh, it's alanshepherd.com um, and there's a link there to it. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I've got a couple of slides about our process. So um, we, uh, the Wales Cooperative Centre, 
Um, there's a slide uh, there. I was working with Paris County Council, which is why the Paris County Council logo is there in the corner. Um, but uh, yeah, we're driving people on a, a routeway or cycling people uh, through this routeway to uh, hopefully create their own uh, community-led house. Um, and uh, we're, this is kind of uh, what we call Engage. So I'm talking to you now for engagement. And we have a program called Explore, uh, which is um, run uh, through the uh, DTA Wales, Development Trust Association Wales. And that allows groups to access some funding and support uh, if they're in a position where they want to explore some different ideas uh, and different models of community-led housing. And then there's an enable phase, uh, which is probably you would come back to one of us, uh, me, Casey, Joe, Claire, or Paul, or um, Dave, who's not with us on the call today. Uh, and we will help you get a bit further on your journey. Um, so please do contact us after this talk and uh, we'll, uh, we'll try and help you out. Uh, that is if you're in Wales. Unfortunately, if you're phoning from England, uh, then we can't help you, but there are uh, different uh, groups uh, in England that can do that. There are community-led housing hubs all over the country, and uh, you should get in touch with uh, one of those. Um, th this is a report we did. We did a piece of uh, analytical research, so it's not just about um, uh, my own personal experience I wanted to share with share this with you um, but these are the kind of benefits that we are seeing from people we interviewed 50 people who are in different types of community-led housing schemes and these are the kind of benefits that people are, are telling us that they're experiencing as a result of being a member of one of these schemes and I certainly can vouch for many of these things um, as I said I was ex had um, uh, feelings of isolation and loneliness in my house, house before when I lived alone, which was having an impact on my mental well-being and happiness. And I've definitely increased skills, confidence, knowledge, employability, and I have a better quality of house and wider benefits community. So I'd say like uh, that, I would definitely say that um, being in this housing co-op has helped me to move on in my life and to change the way I think about things and to increase my, my health and well-being, uh, and as well as all the aspects of uh, having uh, such incredible company for the last six years and great new friendships with people and i'd say that um that extends beyond the house as well because we have a lot of visitors to the house obviously there's five people living in here uh, we have um their friends coming and they bring their knowledge and there's a lot of activity in the house and a lot of discussions and uh, you're kind of just learning about things all the time uh, and i think that's um it was the same when i lived at cat uh, there was obviously a lot of interesting people coming through cats doors uh, every week uh, and um, uh, you could have those kind of in-depth conversations um, that you just wouldn't get in a, if you were living alone or, or in a, a different kind of housing situation um, so there's a i would call those soft benefits and i think it's probably the soft benefits that makes community-led housing uh, stand out a bit compared to other housing uh, affordable housing models uh, there are soft benefits through housing associations but I think they're a little bit different and uh, the same through council housing as well uh, as I think uh, because people are creating the homes themselves in this model uh, they're able to pinpoint what they actually need a bit more uh, from their housing situation and I mean I call them soft benefits because it's not a you know, the hard benefit is a roof over your head. The soft benefit is is this sort of stuff. But actually, it's a very meaningful benefit to a lot of people to have access yeah. to. It's, to, it's, to fifth need. Sort of it's a fifth need. It's bonding. It's love. It's, it's included within all that. It's a fifth need. Water, water, uh, water, warmth and, and home, um, food and food and uh, air. But there's a fifth need, and, and it's it's that soft benefit. It's that us, us. You can't live on your own. You die on your own. Seriously, it, it's not, 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 not really coming through, but you do die on your own. I mean, that's very... Right. Other people, and this interaction, you're talking about the soft benefit, is that. That's it. It's very true. I mean, like there are there are there are statistics that you can find online. There's age concern reports uh, that look at the dangers of isolation. Yeah, I think it's killer. I, I think it's like all the all the social animals die on their own. They're social beings. We're social beings. We're not single people. This society wants you to be optimised and on your own and individually in competition with other individuals, but actually it's a killer. 
So it, they can't do it because it's in, in us, like, you know. Thanks, Frank. That's certainly what I felt living on my own. Um, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah the, the, some people have said it. Uh, it's as dangerous as smoking 15 cigarettes. Yeah, I think it's a fifth need. Fifth that biological it, need. It is definitely a fifth need. Your, your body, your, your member body, and, and the soft benefits are the glue, the thing that, that creates that, you know, that does that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Um, so yeah, that's just about me uh, done for today. Um, Casey, uh, I don't know if we've got any more questions. We do have a, a couple of questions um, around those sort of interpersonal relationships. Um, so one from Julia. So what's your experience around helping good power dynamics? So for example, do you use consensus decision making, but do you find that there's always one person blocking the decision being made? Uh, so we do use consensus decision making. It's actually very rare to have a block. Um, there are sometimes quite um, lively discussions. Uh, I wouldn't say that very many of them are difficult. Um, sometimes you can kind of, I mean, there's a, there's a spectrum there, isn't there? You know, like having a lively discussion uh, can get difficult, but that doesn't happen very often. Uh, there have been situations in the house where um, one person has not um, been on the same page uh, repeatedly about things um, and that person um, eventually did leave, have to leave really, um, but uh, that was the most difficult situation that we've had um, and that was something that I think I learned a lot from in terms of addressing a situation like that. Um, I, I won't go into the whole details of it now because it's quite personal, but um, yeah, they, they do come up and I think that's why your systems uh, are helpful and, and that's why it's good to have them in place. Yeah. And just a, a related question. Yeah, sorry Casey, go, on, go for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One from Rosalind, so do members have to sign up to a formal conflict resolution process or is it more informal or in your secondary rules? So yeah, we do have a conflict resolution process in the secondary rules. Um, so it will be expected that um, as members, they will follow those rules. We, the, the probation period also would really help in that, in the sense that you can, I think, identify within the first six months whether it's going to work or not, both from the point of view of the uh, person who's coming in and, uh, and your own as a house point of view or as a co-op point of view. Um, so, yeah, people do have to... I mean, we when they sign the agreement, um, they, there is a kind of agreement that you do have to sign and then it gets stamped in an official way by the co-op to make when you hand your pound over. And I think uh, it's expected then that you are signing up to all the things that the co-op stands for and people need to be made aware of those things before they before they sign up. Yeah, but uh, if, if you don't have a prospective member admission sort of time of something like six months, how do you find out whether the person is somebody that you want in the co-op? So uh, they, we, we have a, like a recruitment process where we invite people around for meetings and for dinner and uh, to find out about the co-op. Um, but uh, once they are in the co-op on the probation period uh, oh. and then uh, after the end of six months, yeah right uh, they could be asked to leave um, right. which is obviously difficult but um we felt yeah this is where non -violent communication is, is really important really helpful. exactly really helpful it's really we're helpful but um also people have different uh, views of what non-violent communication is and yeah. we have found that in discussions uh before um, yeah. i'm quickly going to bring casey back in frank thank you yeah, um, so do you does the co-op restrict membership to single people or uh, do you allow families or couples to join? So we do have couples. I'm in a couple and there are other people who have been in couples who are currently in couples in the house. Um, we uh, would allow a family to be in here. There isn't a bar to that. But um, at the moment, uh, the way it is, the house is not, the two houses we have is not great for families um, because there's, uh, if families want a separate space, it's not actually possible to do that. And um, we have looked into uh, the idea of expanding the co-op uh, to create uh, there's um, potential properties uh, where we could have like separate flats where people could be part of the co-op, 
to be in their own family. And I would say that also um, that might apply to some single people who actually maybe don't want to live in a housing co-op for whatever, or don't want to live in a shared house, should I say, for whatever reason, but want to be part of a housing co-op for that kind of shared support. Um, so we are looking at different options of making that possible. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, some housing co-ops I know say that uh, if a couple is coming in and they, they have to have one room each uh, in the housing co-op, uh, we don't do that so people can share in a house. And then if they are sharing a room, sorry, uh, but if they if there are two people sharing a room, then the, the both those people are expected to contribute to the bills pot, uh, but not the rental part of the room. Fab. And then a uh, question from Christine. So do you ever get disagreements between the two households? So um, Christine is obviously part of a co-op and they've recently become two housing co-ops. And she's wondering if this some um, this if that is something they may encounter in the future? I mean, yes, it is the answer. Yeah, they may encounter it in the future. Um, we haven't really encountered it. Uh, there's been disagreements with within the membership between people. There's been complicated dynamics between people. There's never been a situation um, where one house has fought one thing and the other house has fought another thing. Uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, so there, unlike my quote at the beginning, there hasn't been uh, two houses at war with each other. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, two households, I should say, being at war with each other. It hasn't ever been like that. And it's been, on the whole, like really supportive of one another and what we've been trying to achieve. Um, obviously, each house has its own culture and different things going on. Um, but, uh, yeah, in terms of disagreement, no, we haven't had a, a thing like that. Great. Well, I think that's it for questions from the chat. Unless anybody has any more for us or for Alan. Or for all of us, any of us. And if anybody, <laughs> any of the rest of the team wants where, to. Yeah, I'd like to know where I can get training for um, the experience that you've had with the difficult um, situations. Um, the difficult situations that you sort of find yourself in to have to say hard and difficult things to people. I want that training. I want to know how to do that because I'll, I'll end up uh, getting, I'll end up inviting people in and then getting uh, kicked out by them because I'm not good at doing that. Yeah. It's a really good question, Frank. Casey, do, do, do we have any um, resources about that? Um, uh, yeah. From the, from the Wales um, Restorative Centre or something like that. Um, yeah, so are you based in Wales, Frank? Yeah, yeah. So um, the Wales Restorative Approaches Partnership. Um, Whoa, yeah, right. That. Sorry, I'll write sorry. that down. Great. Um, yes. I, can, I can put a link in the chat for you as well, so you can have a look at their yeah. website. And, I think um, this applies to, well, many organisations where you get the people coming in, because you're going to get it in the one in 100, you know? The, the, the one organization that I'm really sort of uh, working on, it doesn't matter because it's the community that deals with them. It's, it, they're all time to F off and they behave, behave themselves. But in our society where it's sort of top down, you've got to be the leader kind of thing, you, or it might be on your own. You've got to have those skills. You haven't got any other support, you know. I'm really, uh, I close up, you know, really close up. I'm closed up now. I'm better now than I used to be, but I really close up. It is a big issue, Frank, for a lot of people. Dominated, you know, I can be easily dominated. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks, well, thanks, thanks, Frank. So it's the Wales Restorative, um, say it again, Casey, sorry, <laughs> approaches. Wales Restorative, Wales Restorative, I can't remember myself now. <laughs> the Wales Restorative Approaches Partnership. The link is in the chat, um, Frank, if you want to have a look at their website. Great, great. Thanks very much. No. So, uh, if the, are there any final questions now? Uh, no. Um, so, Ailsa has also uh, recommended non-violent communication as well for, for tra uh, Frank to have a look at. So, I'm sure. Oh, oh yeah, I'm well into that. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm well into that. I, I can get that from the internet. I can get the um, I can get the uh, skills from that from the internet from, from that. No problem. Yeah. Great. Uh, and Rosalind has said that Riz Home Co-op offer training as well. Um, and I think Niall's got a question, actually. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's, it's just on this issue of, you know, uh, how do you deal with more difficult people, put it that way, in housing co-ops. And, uh, I mean, I, I agree with the suggestions people have made. But I think particularly as a co-op gets bigger, 
and you take people in and you take them in with a like our co-op it's it's a contract they sign so yeah. it's not like it's not like probation period you don't really have that luxury we've got over yeah. 100 members who get referrals from the councils we can turn yeah. away three then you have to take someone and you're trying to get the people you think are most cooperable but inevitably you get problems and problematic people have caused a lot of problems in co-ops in london in particular over the years and even led to some collapse of co-ops over a period of time it seems unimaginable but it is the case and co-ops sometimes have, have tried to deal with them in a bit of a ham-fisted way and you know tried to basically get rid of them give a notice to quit and then when it goes to the courts they they uh judges they whatever magistrates they, they do they do not have a real understanding of housing co-ops and all they see is oh this is a very punitive management way they're getting rid of this person just because they've got different views on things uh so so it can be a big problem particularly as you get bigger and i just think anybody starting up a co-op uh, i would just strongly encourage them to get good advice from cooperative bodies about their uh, rules and their uh, policies their code of conduct and so on and have written in it as much as possible policies to deal with uh, people who are being very destructive because a lot of the co-op in London in particular, probably in different parts of the country, were established in the early 80s and they're very idealistic type rules. <laughs> and the problem is it doesn't work with everybody. Uh, and, you, and you can be, you know, you're lumbered with people who are a problem for years and years. And uh, I know several cases where it's a real problem in London co-ops. And it, just, it also means that some people just are good people who want to go on managing committees and so on. They just don't, they go onto it for a while and get fed up with the rows and some individuals and drop away. So it actually causes a real problem for uh, the running of co-ops. I, I know organisations like the Confederation of uh, Housing Co-ops uh, has has you know been talking to the the government about this and saying they they need legislation that sort of as they call it has a handbrake to allow co-ops to be able to deal with emergency situations or very problematic tenants uh, in a much more effective way. And of course, we don't want any draconian type rules. We want to live together and so on. But I think the point that Alan made was good that our first priority has to be to defend and protect the co-op itself as a general body as a whole uh, and it's not the, it's not the property of one or two people so I, I would just say you know think about it long and hard the types of policies and uh, rules you have when you're starting. Thanks. Hi, I have a question from Leone for you if that's okay so can you recommend any good practice rules um, for them to have a look at? Well, uh, I mean, we, in, in my own court, we've been going through for years trying to improve the rules and policies. But I, I think, uh, you know, in Wales, I'm sure there's bodies that have, uh, you know, got model rules and so on and policies in, in England, where I am and in London. Uh, I would suggest go to the uh, CCH, yeah. Confederation of Cooperative Housing website, and they have got good stuff there. I mean, some of it might be only accessible to members, but uh, just, just ring them up and you'll, you'll definitely get good help. And advice on this uh, issue because I've dealt, I've worked with some of the, the people there, like Blaise Lambert, uh, yeah. who's I know he's in, in charge of policy, I think, at the CCH, and he he uh, very much is keen that better policy can be developed on this issue. Great, thanks for that. Okay, uh, so if we're all done, it's been really, really lovely uh, seeing you all here. Thanks so much for coming and uh, taking part. and. Um, uh seeing what, what we're doing here and uh yeah please do keep in touch um drop me an email if you have any follow-up questions or any of the team and uh be really happy to help um have a good friday and enjoy your weekend and um yeah see you soon great thanks very much <laughs> thank you thanks. where's it where's the off button <laughs> <laughs> there we go Shall we just end? Uh, yeah, I'll, I was trying to uh, open my chat so I could save the chat. I don't know oh, if you can. Do that. Can you save the chat there? Yeah, chat saved, show and folder. Brilliant.
Oh, I should stop recording as well.